Welcome back. We're talking about the ongoing crisis in Ukraine where events are moving very fast. With me from Moscow is John Helvig. He is the managing partner for a leading business firm in Russia. And right here with me in Washington is Anton Fidyashin. He is the executive director for Russian culture at American University. Uh, John, let me start with you this, this time. Uh, for Vladimir Putin, this has been very good domestically, hasn't it? His support, political support in Russia has been rising very, very fast. Yes, uh, that is very true. Uh, we have to remember that uh, Putin's uh, support has been always very, very good. Uh, so uh, at the lowest, it has uh, hit uh, something about uh, 60 percent, uh, maybe 55, uh, something like that. Now it's risen to, uh, depending on how you measure it and who measures to 70, 75 or even uh, 80 percent uh, uh, approval uh, rating. It's also something that uh, I feel and see on the ground with people I, 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 I discuss. Like uh, half a year ago, uh, you would go more into argument about uh, uh, how beneficial Putin is uh, for the country and so on. But uh, now uh, I rarely meet uh, people that would not uh, feel that uh, Putin is doing a good jo uh, great job. Anton, uh, what do you think motivated Vladimir Putin to get involved in Ukraine in this way? There is one argument people say, look, his country was being encircled by NATO, uh, that uh, NATO was expanding eastwards, that he had done a lot for the United States diplomatically and got nothing in return. And one of the arguments is that he was being seen by the West as the leader of a country that lost the Cold War. Yes, uh, that has been the Russian argument, and I have to say that there is uh, a lot of uh, truth in it, especially when it came to the possibility of NATO expansion into Sevastopol, into Ukraine, and more specifically into uh, the Crimea. I think the Russians were particularly afraid that uh, the fate of their fleet, regardless of what promises they would have been given by the West and by the Ukrainian government, would simply be kicked out of uh, Sevastopol, which has traditionally, for 200 years now, been the seat of uh, the Russian navies and all of their different political manifestations. The other side of this issue, of course, is the economic one. The Russians understand perfectly well that Ukraine being brought into the uh, EU as a whole would uh, spell uh, ruin for the eastern part of, uh, of the country because most of the uh, industry there, which is dependent on Russian orders, would collapse. And this would, of course, affect uh, the Russian economy. So uh, the Russians have been asking for tripartite uh, uh, dialogue, or rather uh, negotiations about the fate of Ukraine between Brussels, Kiev, and Moscow. And this happened as uh, early as uh, late November of last year, before this entire mess began. But it looks Brussels, like we may but come back. Brussels said no way, that's not happening. Brussels said no way, because the Europeans, when, when Putin made this offer in mid-November, the Europeans were hoping that Yanukovych will sign the EU agreement. And you know, what's remarkable is that uh, for, despite the fact that the current government has signed a political association agreement with the EU, once they looked at the details of the economic conditions that would be imposed on them, the current government also refused to sign, essentially doing exactly what Yanukovych had done before, and that was the chief argument for the protesters to take to Maidan. Done. Okay, John, part of this agreement that was reached today talks about long-term constitutional reform. Uh, is that just diplomatic code for more autonomy for those regions in eastern Ukraine that have uh, a Russian-speaking majority? Yeah, it must be. It must mean that because uh, Russia has uh, said very clearly from uh, uh, especially Lavrov when he met with uh, Kerry in Paris a couple of weeks ago, and it has been coming out from Putin and, and, and uh, from La uh, Lavrov in many occasions that uh, they want to have a constitutional uh, reform, meaning a representative government uh, in uh, East Ukraine. Uh, they, have, they have been speaking about federalization, uh, which means that uh, uh, the uh, regions really would uh, get some kind of uh, auto autonomy. And uh, now the question is just like how far they will go. Because there has been discussions uh, about uh, forming a so-called uh, Nova Russia uh, Federation, which uh, those uh, eastern uh, Ukrainian parts uh, where Russian population live, they used to be called uh, Nova Russia before the Soviet uh, Revolution. They were just an integrated part of, uh, of Russia. And uh, some people uh, and uh, some people in Russia have been saying that uh, 
they should go very far towards that federalization. Now the question is only how far they will go. Uh, and also here's the question of uh, resurrecting or establishing a Russian language as the, in parallel with the Ukrainian language as the first official uh, language uh, uh, of the country. And I think that's also uh, a demand that uh, Russia will not let go. Right, and Anton, I suppose the other important thing is that we need to have an elected government in Kiev. At the moment, we have a self-appointed government. So to achieve any kind of legitimacy, there has to be elections pretty soon. Absolutely. And it's not just a question of presidential elections, which are already set for the 25th of May. There will also have to be re-elections to the Ukrainian parliament, uh, because the current government uh, has only two members out of uh, about 20 who actually come from eastern Ukraine, but aren't actually members of uh, any parties that represent the eastern Ukrainians. And so it's understandable why the eastern Ukrainians have been very suspicious of uh, the current Kiev government because they don't see it as representing any of their local uh, uh, interests. Okay. Uh, John, um, do you think this latest agreement uh, will stave off further sanctions against Moscow? Does it ease the situation for Moscow as far as the threat of sanctions are concerned? Yeah, uh, well, uh, what is for sure that uh, European businesses uh, don't want to have any sanctions and they are re putting really big pressure on the European uh, politicians. And I've seen that now uh, the politicians are, are yielding in, uh, into it. The U.S. situation uh, might be more hardline here because they don't have so much to lose uh, in uh, relation to Russian trade. So uh, definitely I think that uh, if the signs that are coming out now from Geneva, that there will be a de-escalation and, uh, and this roadmap uh, for peace uh, will be uh, followed, then I'm sure uh, that uh, it will ease any pressure on new sanctions, for, of course. Question is, uh, what will happen uh, with the sanctions that are in force? They, as such, are not uh, very severe, uh, but what they are bad about is that uh, they send out a very bad signal for development and investment. Anton, we've got about 20 seconds left. Do you agree with those sentiments? Yes, absolutely. I think it's unfortunate that we've been talking about sanctions and uh, uh, movements of, uh, of troops uh, so much over the past weeks when we should have been talking about uh, the economic situation in Ukraine and exactly what the countries that are involved in the diplomatic talks will be doing. So far, by the way, the United States has given the least direct economic aid to Ukraine, and we'll see if the United States will increase its uh, participation in fixing Ukraine's problem, which is ultimately economic. Okay, that's where we have to leave this discussion for the moment. Anton Fedyashin, John Helvick in Moscow. Thanks to both of you for joining us. When we come back, I'll talk with a former United States ambassador to Ukraine and a former U.S. ambassador to Georgia about Washington's role in the events in Ukraine. Stay with us.